We're joined today by council members Traeger, Barron, Miller, and Powers. Today, we will begin a hearing on a real property tax exemption for an affordable housing development, and then we will vote on that application and three other items that we heard at our prior meetings. Our first item is the Hunters Point South Parcels F&G Article 11 tax exemption. LU 563 is an application submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for the approval of a real property tax exemption for property located in Queens at Block 6, Lots 20 and 30. This tax exemption will facilitate the development of two buildings, approximately 57 and 33 stories respectively, that will include 847 units of affordable housing, 283 units of market rate housing, retail community facility space, and approximately 100 parking spaces. The development site is located in Council Member Van Bramer's district. We're joined today by representatives of HPD, and they are Tristan Nadal and Lacey Tauber. Before you begin, council will swear you in. Please raise your right hands. Please state your names. Tristan Nadell. Lacey Tauber. Do you affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. You may begin. Great. Land use number 563 consists of an exemption area located at block 6, lots 30 and 20 in Council District 26, which will be the development site for a project known as Hunters Point South Parcels F and G. HPD selected the development team, Gotham, or Gotham Organization in Riseboro, through a competitive process in April 2017. They propose to develop two mixed-use, mixed-income, multiple dwellings that will provide affordable rental housing for families under HPD's Mixed Middle Income program. The project will include approximately 1,132 units across two buildings, approximately 850 of which, or 75%, will be permanently affordable. This includes 10%, approximately 114 units, set aside for the formerly homeless. Of the units to be marketed through Housing Connect, approximately 20%, or 170 units, will have rent set at 27% to 50% of the area median income, AMI, and will be available to those making up to 50% of AMI. Approximately one-third, 284 units, will have rent set at 77 to 100% of AMI and will be av available to those making up to 125% of AMI. Approximately one-third will have rent set at 125% of AMI and will be available to those making up to 165% of AMI. This affordable component includes 98 units that will be set aside for seniors making up to 80% of AMI. The project also includes market rate units in both buildings, approximately 25% of the total, or 283 units, plus two superintendent's units. The building to be constructed at parcel F, um, block six, lot 30, will be approximately 57 stories with 689 units, and the building to be located at parcel G, block six, lot 20, will be approximately 33 stories with 443 units. There will be a mixture of unit sizes, including 276 studios, 514 one-bedrooms, 275 two-bedrooms, 65 three-bedrooms. Rents will range from $375 for a studio at 20% of AMI to $3,391 for a three-bedroom at 125% AMI. The project is also anticipated to include commercial and community facility space, parking for 100 vehicles, and a number of other amenities, including a rooftop garden, co-working spaces, a gym, and both outdoor and indoor lounges. The Hunters Point South project was originally approved for disposition by the council in 2008 and amended in 2018. However, the exemption area comprised of Lot 6, Lots 30, and 20 requires, requires Article 11 tax benefits in order to facilitate construction of the project and assist with affordability of the low-income rental units. HPD is before the council seeking Article 11 tax benefits with a term of 40 years that will coincide with the regulatory agreement, which has a term of 60 years. The estimated cumulative value of the tax exemption is $465,969,531, with a net present value of $130,178,485. And I'm going to turn it over to Tristan from Gotham to run you through more details about the project. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Lacey. Um, as Lacey mentioned, uh, I re represent Gotham. We were designated by HPD as the master developer for this site. A little history on Gotham. It's uh, been developing in New York for over 100 years, the fifth generation family run company uh, with a long history of doing public private partnerships and partnerships with nonprofits to produce mixed income affordable housing in the city. And our partner, uh, Riseboro Community Partnership, is our local nonprofit. Uh, who has extensive uh, experience doing senior housing as well as um, on the ground local community work uh, in this area. So just from a high level, um, just to give a little perspective of the location, F and G are the last two um, farthest south parcels in the Hunters Point South uh, development piece, uh, parcels A and B are already developed as mixed income housing. Parcel C has been allocated and parcels D and E are for future development. Um, the project, uh, as, as Lacey mentioned, will have 1,132 units approximately with 98 uh, senior housing units and 114 formerly homeless apartments. There is a school being built on the same zoning lot as uh, parcel F. Um, that's currently under construction and anticipated by the SEA outside of this project. Um, starting from the ground up, <clears throat> we anticipate uh, the ground floor to have about 9,000 square feet of retail space along Center, Center Boulevard, and then community facility space uh, between both buildings of about 26,000 square feet. Um, Included in that is a boathouse that will service the kayak launch uh, just off of Parcel G, uh, a space for Flux Factory that we have a purchase and sale agreement currently under negotiation for to actually condo out so that it's a local art organization that will own in the building a public restroom for the use of um, the public and uh, park goers uh, for the newly completed Hunters Point South Park. Um, and then other community uses to be determined in the Parcel F building uh, that are expected to be in the um, medical and educational use and retail along Center Boulevard that will complement the park and the local residents, uh, and as well as finally a rooftop farm that uh, will be open to the public of about 6,000 square feet. Um, further, we have uh, a bunch of public space, um, again, the rooftop farm, number one noted here, as well as a publicly open space, uh, number four, at the corner of Center Boulevard and 57th Avenue, um, which will be both open to the public, and then a handful of outdoor spaces for the residents themselves, um, promoting kind of a healthy lifestyle living within the building. Um, Here's just a quick axon of the two, two buildings and the breakdown of space. As you can see, there's a senior wing in the Parcel F building, which uh, again con consists of 98 units that will have their own social services um, and design specific for uh, senior use. Um, here we have, uh, again, the breakdown of the AMIs and Residential units, 75% affordability across five different AMI tiers, so really trying to um, have an inclusive intergenerational building here, almost 850 units um, with a fairly low skew and an average AMI uh, of around 85%. And finally, some, some uh, highlights of, of the building. We'll have um, indoor amenity space, um, some sustainable features that uh, include heat pumps, uh, low-E glass, water-conserving fixtures, uh, Energy Star, as well as resiliency, given its location, uh, which include uh, MEP spaces above the second floor, dry flood proofing for the below-grade spaces, and generators on site. Um, and we also have a handful of um, local hiring programs that we're abiding by, as well as uh, minority and women business uh, enterprise um, 
hiring practices that we're doing along with HPD is uh, including the build up program and Hire NYC. And this will be a 32 BJ operated building upon completion. And here's just a, a view of the, the lower floors to show kind of the, the integration uh, into the uh, existing environment, um, try to promote livelihood, a lot of glass, a lot of activity on the ground floor for safety. And that's the project. Thank you. We've been joined by Councilmember Koo. I'm going to defer to my colleagues at this time for questions. Councilmember Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. You're requesting tax exemption, Article 11 tax benefits for this project? That's correct. And you're going to have at least 50% of these apartments at 125% of the AMI or higher. The unregulated means whatever can be gotten for the apartment. Is that correct? 25% will be at market rate, correct? At market rate. And 25% will be at 125% of the AMI. So when I add that to the percentage at 100% of the AMI, that's... 70% of these apartments at 100% of the AMI or greater. Correct. And these are towers. How many stories? 57 and 33. 57 and 33. And only 100 parking spaces come with this? Correct. I think that the city is not getting uh, enough for its investment and giving what a cumulative value of tax exemption of $466 million. I think that we're not getting uh, enough of a benefit, and uh, I'll be voting against this project. <coughs> Councilmember Miller? Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of questions. The, uh, how, how, how many units would be set aside for homeless? It's 10%. 10%. Um, so, so they have that. 100, 114. 114. That's consistent with the current uh, term paper that Correct. the city has there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that is, and that 10%. Did that come from the below 50%? Is that a set aside from that? Just as a matter of clarity, does that, it's is ten, that included? It's 10% in of the, the total. Um, I, think, I think the version that you saw, I think the one here is slightly updated, so it calls out the formerly homeless um, specifically in the version that you have in front of you. Um, that shows the breakdown, formerly homeless versus the, the different affordable tiers that will go through Housing Connect. Okay, and does that diminish at all the number of 50% and below? So there's 20% of units um, at 50% AMI So those below. are taken off from the yeah. top? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. So we have uh, 100 and. 13, uh, 1,100 units, is that is that 10%, the 1,100, the total 1,100, then we go into the various AMIs? Correct. <clears throat> and uh, what percentage is market rate? 25% of the total. 25%. And what percentage is uh, one, above 100? Above 100 is 50, uh, sorry, is 70%. So the affordable yes, units so is before, about. I'm sorry, just, sorry. just 100, so the affordable not 100, units, it's between about a 100 third. and 125. How many units between 100 and 125? There's 30% are between 30 and 80, and then the rest of the units are 100 and above. I, w I was uh, very specifically because there's a, uh, there, there's 45% is in 100 to 125. Okay, and then you have 125 
How many units? Uh, sorry. Okay. How many? So, okay. so you know what? This would probably be easy. How many are market rate? Twenty-five. Twenty-five percent of the total. Twenty-five percent, and the one twenty-five. Uh, if you put that in the band, that goes as high as one six five. That's the marketing band. Marketing. Right. Exactly. But the that, rents are set at one hundred and twenty-five percent of it. Right, but the marketing band goes as high as is, is one sixty-five. And what what are the rents for those? Um, I don't have that number in front of me right now. Do you? Oh, actually, I do. No, they're one. I'm, can I uh, call on my colleague um, for that? <clears throat> Council's going to swear you in. Okay. Please raise your right hand and state your name. Nina Ritchie. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all uh, council member questions? Yes. Okay. So. Um, how many are market rate and what is what is the rents at 165 so 25% of the project is market rate the units that are marketed up to 165% of AMI have a are underwritten and rented to families earning um, a minimum of 125% of AMI um, and I, I'll have those rents for you in just a second Um, a studio is rented for $1,946 a month. A one bedroom is $2,442 a month. A two bedroom is $2,943 a month. And a three bedroom is $3,391 a month. What is market rate the, in this community? Um, the rents that we're underwriting to for a studio are about $2,600. The uh, one-bedroom units, we're underwriting at $3,100. The two bedrooms are $4,500. And the three bedrooms are uh, $5,270. So in the analysis of this development, um, Can we do this project without the 25% market, considering that you have up to 165% AMI? I mean, I think I would just say to that, so this program is, you know, a little bit different from some of the ones that, you know, we see, we have seen in this committee. But, you know, we are committed to doing affordable at a, at a broad range of incomes. and. This program allows us to to hit a really broad range. You know, it has a senior component, it has a I'm not homeless against component. broad range. No, I, really I understand. I just, market rate and protecting sure. the, the, the integrity of communities and future communities, and and so that people aren't displaced. I come from a community that have higher AMIs, but that means that we want um, housing to to be a microcosm of that, and 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 so we're just trying to ascertain whether or not the current and future um, uh, residents of, of this community can and f gen for generations can maintain in the community can can remain in the communities that they know and, and have grown up in and whether or not they're, they're going to be displaced and, and so we're trying to get to whether or not mm -hmm. this is the most efficient use of of our dollars mm -hmm. in terms of doing that can we do this without maximizing the profits of developers it was just merely the question, and, and is where we were getting to. Um, and no further questions. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Koo, did you have questions? No, thank you. Okay. Can, can you just give us um, an idea of how, how these units will be, um, will be placed? How will, how will you find placement? Um, for these units? How, how will you seek residents? The affordable units go through Housing Connect. Um, the formerly homeless units are, uh, they're matched from folks coming out of the shelter system that DHS has identified as being ready for permanent housing and then they work with our, um, our team to match folks to units that become available. Um, those are the two main ways. Is this, is this a project 
does it have anything to do with community board input as far as as far as housing these units um, as far as a percentage going to community board community board residents yeah preferences any of the units that go through um, the the HPD Housing Connect as of now have um, a 50% community preference, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions from my colleagues, you are excused, and thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna call up our next panel. We'll call up uh, Frederico Hernandez, 32BJ. And Emily, is it Emily Cord? Kurtz? Kurtz? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, no, I'll give it to you when I'm finished. Okay. Okay. How does it work? You just punch in and talk? You may begin. Hello, oh, got it. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Adams and member of the South community. My name is Federico Hernandez and I'll be a member of the 32BJ for six years. Uh, as you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union represented, with, um, sorry, representing 85,000 property service workers across the city. We are here today in support on the disposition of the city land on Gotham organization. Project at Hunter Point on the South. The Gotham organization has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wages building service jobs to the future property service workers on the sites. A prevailing wage like mine, allowing working families on the city to live with dignity. Before I got a paid job prevailing wage, I struggle to support my kids, and uh, raising two kids without health insurance is not, it's not, it's not, it's not really not good. Okay, my believe. Family raising two kids uh, without the health insurance and job security was a stressful. Now I have a peace of mind and never worry about going to pay my rent. All right. And uh, all working family deserve this. In addition, we are fully support the project as will create 900 units of much needed proper, permanently affordable housing in online city. And I'm sorry, I just get a little nervous. The Gotham organization has a track record of creating jobs throughout the portfolio in long time permanent ship with 32BJ. We are happy to stand here and support them and urge to approve this um, disposition. I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Kurtz. I'm Vice President of Housing at the Riseboro Community Partnership, and I, I appreciate the opportunity just to speak in behalf of this um, proposal. Uh, I think one of the things that um, that I'm really excited about this project is the ability to create senior units outside of of the very um, the very uh, limited resource of, of housing uh, vouchers for senior uh, for senior housing. So that's something that's been really important to us in, in the development of this project and figuring out new ways to create uh, additional units of affordable senior housing. Um, and in addition to uh, a, a really thoughtful uh, slew of services that will be provided at the building, um, uh, primarily for the residents, 
uh, with my organization, RiseRO, who, as Tristan mentioned, has we have a for over 40 years of experience uh, providing affordable housing, providing on-site services to the to the members of of our residences, and um, a really strong ties with the low-income community of New York City. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you both very much for being here today. Thank you. Councilmember Traeger? Yes. Can you come back? Just a sec. <laughs> Forgive me. It's the former teacher in me that asks questions sometimes. So I uh, appreciate your service. And uh, just you mentioned um, on site services. Can you elaborate what kind of on site services will be provided for residents? So traditionally in our senior buildings at Riseboro, we provide. Um, what uh, we call light touch in name only services to to our seniors. So this is um, benefit enrollment, um, uh, light case management. Um, but uh, what we really are doing is for those people that don't have a safety net of either family or friends, we are providing them with that community in the building. So we work very hard to build community for our senior residents. Um, in addition to, um, so we'll do a daily check-in if someone, if, if it's deemed necessary for that particular resident, we um, uh, create a community in, in the buildings through, um, through meetings and through workshops. Um, and we also do a lot of um, art classes and dance classes. Re really, all of our, it, it's all intended to create community and create um, a home for, for the seniors. Some who some of our seniors do have that safety net or, or connection to community and some don't and hopefully um, I believe most of them enjoy the, the services that we're providing. And I always say of course we have a weekly bingo game in every single building um, as well because that is one of the um, more popular uh, activities in our senior buildings. Right, no, I, I certainly appreciate that. It just in, in the packet that we were given, it's it's we see senior housing, we see the term phrase community facility, um, but will there be a physical space, a senior center? No, it's not a senior center. These but, are. But will there be a space for seniors to meet? That, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's my question. Absolutely yes. So in the in the the senior unit. Um, wing there is a community room with uh, uh, it's it's planned to provide space both for for meetings for quiet reflection space for uh, physical exercise for arts and it uh, it connects to an outside um, patio as well so there's and um, there's absolutely um, space to to provide those types of services and create that community okay and lastly uh as part of the on-site services, will there be any uh, social workers stationed at, at the development? So our our staff plan includes social service coordinators. If you're asking if there's a licensed clinical social worker, um, ours uh, there's not going to be a full-time licensed clinical social worker on staff. The program, our programming, our programs do have social workers, licensed social workers, but not a full-time on, on staff. But a social service coordinator, yes. Okay, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna push for more social workers in our city and everywhere I can, and so I think we need more. And I, again, I do appreciate your time being here today. Thank you, Chair. I, and I fully, I fully agree. Uh, On-site social services are, are um, tantamount to providing uh, housing. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony today. Are there any more members of the public wishing to testify on these items? Seeing none, I now close today's public hearing. We will lay this item over. We will... Okay. 
We will now vote to approve with modifications LUs 548 and LU 549, which are related to the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. LU 548 is an application submitted by the Department of Transportation, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the acquisition of various properties along the FDR Drive and Councilmember Rivera, Chin, and Powers Districts for a flood protection system. LU 549 is a related application submitted by the New York City Department of Small Business Services pursuant to Section 201 of the New York City Charter for an amendment of Article 6, Chapter 2, Special Regulations Applying in the Waterfront Area of the Zoning Resolution of the New of the City of New York, modifying special regulations for zoning lots that include parks located in a marginal street, wharf, or place in an M-1 district in Manhattan community, community District 6. The East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, or ESCR, is a first of its kind in New York. The comprehensive flood protection system along the East River in Manhattan seeks to provide critical flood protection for more than 110,000 vulnerable New Yorkers. Since our October 3rd hearing, the affected council members have been fighting hard to secure commitments to ensure that the impacts to the community during construction are lessened as much as possible. We'll now have remarks from council member Keith Powers. Thank you. Uh, I will be reading today a statement uh, both uh, from myself, uh, council member Margaret Chin, and council member Carlina Rivera, who are the other council members representing the area in this uh, this zoning action. Uh, so I'll be reading on behalf of the three of us. Thank you to the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions, and Chair Adams for considering our comments as you vote on the land use items associated with the city's East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, commonly known as ESCR. The three of us, having personally experienced the devastation that Hurricane Sandy wrought on the neighborhoods that we serve, understood that the city needed to ensure this project was done quickly, but also correctly. The success of ESCR will lay the groundwork for future resiliency projects around the city, which is why we have been so adamant in our advocacy and engagement on this project. While community engagement in this process has not been always sufficient, we appreciate the city's acknowledgement of its own shortcomings in this regard and its recommitment to transparency and to the community. Today we, re we receive some good news that I think is some news for folks in this room as well, that the administration has announced an agreement with us on several items that will help improve the plan and address some of the community concerns, including, I'll read a few of those commitments, the support for a community advisory group to provide information and advice are related to the plan moving forward, the release of several analytical documents that support the project's underlying design, plans for an Envision Platinum Sustainable Certification for this project, re-engagement around interim flood protections, and a guarantee to study the future of the FDR drive, amongst others. We continue to engage with the administration to finalize a robust list of other key commitments that maintains a balance between flood protection and mitigation efforts while also providing long-term investments in all three districts and communities. We encourage the subcommittee and ask the subcommittee as you consider this to move these land use items forward to the November 12th land use committee, which will give us an opportunity to continue our work, to work with the administration, to finalize the plans for this project, secure additional commitments for the project, but also provide the needed and necessary flood protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Powers. We will also vote to approve LU 571 to make a technical amendment to Resolution 733 of 2019, which approved an urban development action area, an urban development action area project, and a disposition of real property located at 4697 Third Avenue, blocks 3041, lots 38 and 40 in the Bronx. The amendment will remove an incorrect reference to the private housing finance law to facilitate development of affordable housing in Council Member Torres' district. I now call for a vote to approve LUs 571 and to approve with modifications LUs 548 and, four and 549. Council, please call the roll. Adams. Aye on all. Barron. Request time to explain my vote. Council Member Barron. Thank you. I think that the hearing that I attended regarding the East Side Coastal Re Resiliency Program um, exposed a lot 
that left that was left undone, unsaid, unexplored, and unanswered. And I don't know, with all due respect to my colleague, I don't know exactly what this new uh, these new offers entail. And I do not think that they're substantive enough, as they have been outlined here, for me to support this program moving forward. So I'll be voting no on 548, 549, and yes on 571. Who? Oh, I. Miller. Aye. Traeger. Uh, permission to expand my vote? Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to note uh, for for the record, and first of all, I, I commend, uh, I know how incredibly hard uh, working uh, my colleagues are in terms of resiliency in, in the city. We have a lot of work to do to continue to bolster our resiliency in the state of New York. I uh, just want to know for the record that the Army Corps of Engineers said to me in a meeting that the boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens, of course, all five boroughs are in the line in terms of climate change impact, but the boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens are really at the front epicenter of some of the most drastic impacts of climate change. And yet, we don't see any type of resources that we're talking about, uh, you know, here today, both in terms of federal, state, and city. Um, of course, I support a five-borough resiliency plan. We have to help every borough, every neighborhood, every zip code, no question about it. But uh, as we speak, the only thing that they gave to my part of town is that they gave us some sand on Coney Island Beach, which already has eroded. Um, that's our, that, that was, that, that's the vision. We have study, we have to study after study after study with nothing funded. Uh, so it's insulting, it's dangerous, it's irresponsible in terms of the unequal attention and application of resources to protect every neighborhood in New York City. Uh, and so it's not just, you know, in the name of uh, a hurricane that I worry about. It's also a FEMA flood map that's in the process of being drastically redrawn that will mandate thousands and thousands of more families to, to purchase flood insurance, which will displace working low-income families in my neighborhood and across New York City. And these are the types of resiliency projects that we need to invest in that can mitigate some of those expenses. So I just want to note that for the record, that the city administration who, who talks about the tale of two cities uh, for folks from Albany who took a good game but produced very little, and Washington where there's absolutely no leadership, um, we still have some of the most vulnerable people who are still recovering from the worst storm in history left out to dry. And so I, again, will not uh, ever uh, look to hurt any other neighbor because every neighborhood, whether it's Manhattan, which deserves, I think they call it the big U, even though it's only funded as half a J, maybe. Uh, we, we, every neighborhood deserves a well thought out community based funded plan. Um, so I, I will support, but with the understanding that we have to help every single borough in every single zip code. Thank you. By a vote of five in the affirmative, with, uh, Zero in the negative with zero abstentions for LU 571 and four in the affirmative, one in the negative and zero abstentions for LUs 548 and 549. The items are recommended for referral to the full land use committee. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>